please. Tobias Lindholm, the writer and director. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Roby. I'm one of the film critics for The Telegraph. Thanks for staying and thanks for coming out uh, this evening. Uh, we have about half an hour of uh, time to uh, ask to be as anything you feel like asking once I've got the ball rolling a little bit. Hopefully these mics are working. Let's check it. Yes. Yeah. Sound OK? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Tobias, now, 2002 and three, when um, the Danish troops in invaded Afghanistan, I gather that's the first time in your lifetime that uh, essentially Denmark went to war. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could tell us about um, what that felt like as a Danish person when, when that was announced and what the kind of public reaction was to the war as it began and then as it <coughs> evolved and what kind of change there was in the, the public consciousness. Well, um, Iraq and then Afghanistan was, was the first war. Denmark was involved in since the Second World War and the uh, Second World War for five hours. Um, and that war was a logical war, you could say, because we were protecting our own border. Now, this war was a political war, and we would send out troops. We hadn't done that before. We've been part of uh, peacekeeping troops in ex Yugoslavia, but that's a whole other story than actually going in and invading um, another country far, far away from home. Um, I remember it as very scary, um, and for me especially, um, and I guess my generations of guys who wasn't soldiers, totally un un understandable what we were doing out there. At the same time, the whole world was affected by 9-11. Uh, um, so we knew that we had something had to be done. And I remember this campaign in the news about the evilness of the Taliban um, regime. I remember the footage of women being beaten up in the streets for being women. I remember uh, the, 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 the just destruction of old art treasures. I remember all of that that became kind of the argument for this invasion um, as well. Um, and, and it was very political. And I do believe that, that at that point was some kind of at least loyalty to the troops. And, 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 and we didn't know as a country what we were getting ourselves into. So nobody really knew um, what was going on other than the feeling of being part of the world um, and, the, and us trying to be behind the troops in some way. Mm. And there was presumably rather like in the UK a, a bit of a sea change in terms of the attitude as the war proceeded and became more and more um, <clears throat> you know, fraught with, with these kind of problems and with these kind of errors. Um, Definitely. I, I, I do believe that the first change of events happened when when, when, when dead soldiers started to come home, um, and when people after some time started to doubt the value of this war, and started to doubt the, the, the value of the job that the guys did out there, um, not the guys, but, but, but the soldiers, um, men and women. Um, but I actually do believe that the two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, were mixed up in the public opinion, so nobody really knew what they were talking about. It was more like a broad vision of, yeah, there's a war going on, we're down there, um, we're getting these terrible images home, um, but we're kind of distant. And as soon as it became a, a fellow countryman, a fellow Dane who came home dead, and you saw a crying mother on camera, uh, the, the, the attitude um, about this war started to change. And, and, and suddenly the political climate started to change. And, and that's where the perspective of this film started, because suddenly the politicians who had sent the soldiers to war started to to need to justify their own actions. And in my opinion, needed to, in some cases, um, wash their hands. And then these trials started to come, these, these ideas of, 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 of the pure war existing, like that you can go out and invade a country far away from home, bomb and shoot people, and then still have justice. Uh, for me, that is an absurd idea. Um, at least it were at that point. And, and I do believe that that grew into what we see here uh, and the subject of this film. Mm. And then in, in, in 2012, I, I, um, the thing is, I knew that I wanted to do a war film. Um, there's the, it, it's almost a genre. There's a tradition of it. I do believe that the, is it me? No. It's someone, don't worry. <laughs> um, 
there's a tradition of war films, and I do believe that, the, that they, especially the Vietnam films coming out of the US, helped uh, a nation to understand what has happened out there and, and, and work on. And, and, and I think that we are on a small scale post-Vietnam phase in Denmark right now, or in Northern Europe, uh, trying to, to understand what we've been part of out there for, 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 for 10 years or more. Um, and what, it, what effect it has had on the, on the world, but also nationally. Mm. So it, you chose this subject after your 2012 film, A Hijacking, which... Well, I was actually looking, seen. before that, I you was were. looking for a war film, but, but what we've seen with war films is often the de dehumanization of a character. You take a young, you're a young person and you bring him or her to war, and then you see how that uh, develops into a, a, a non-human. Mm. Um, and, and we all knew that story, that war could do that to you, so I didn't want to do that story, but I was looking for an angle. And then I read an article, an interview with a Danish officer going on his third, uh, uh, his third time to, to Afghanistan, serving. And he said, I'm not afraid of getting killed down there. I'm afraid of getting prosecuted when I get back home. Because the political wishes in Denmark and the rules of engagement are not uh, uh, the same anymore. Mm. So I'm, I, I don't think that I can do my job and not be prosecuted when I get back home. So that was his biggest fear. And for me, that kind of became mm. the way in because that was so complex that I really couldn't deal with it. So I thought, well, I need to understand this, and then hopefully I'll be make, able to, to make a story about it. Mm. And, and in putting the film together, I know you did a lot of research on the ground, um, not only with Danish soldiers, but with um, Afghan civilians and even Taliban uh, mm -hmm. fighters. Do you want to tell us about the process of talking to them and how everything they gave you uh, helped the script take shape? Well, the thing is, and, and, and there's a contradiction here, I, I'm a writer, I'm a fictional writer, but I'm not amused by my, my own imagination. I think it's pretty boring um, to sit down and make stuff up. I mean, it's never been my thing. I was not a good player when I was a kid. <laughs> I was good at sports because there was rules to follow. Um, so I love to go out into the world and talk to people. And I knew that if I was going to do this film, I needed the witnesses of war. I haven't been a soldier. Um, so how, who was I? to imagine what was going on. Who was I to be judgmental? Who was I to be? I knew that I was just, well, basically a parasite to other people's lives. I think that we as storytellers have a responsibility to tell the truth if we are doing realistic stuff. I don't want to change anything. I want to, not that I don't want to entertain, but I don't want to make entertainment out of reality. I want to find the stories that can carry themselves on. And so I met, at a wedding, pretty drunk, I met this guy who had served in Afghanistan a couple of times, and I started to ask him questions, and we decided to sober up and, and, and meet for coffee uh, a couple of days later, and we did. And he became my way into understanding the specific and practical job of the guys out there. What were they doing? Why would they go on patrols with no other uh, um, outcome than being on that patrol? Mm -hmm. um, what is the point of that? How would you do it? How do you prepare for it? How do you handle it? All the questions that I had no answers to. Um, and slowly, he would bring in some of the friends that he had served with, uh, the butcher that we see in the film, the snipers. Slowly, they all, all came in and started to, to help us out to, to build this story. Um, and I promised them only that I would be truthful uh, um, and try to be as respectful about the material that they gave me as possible. They didn't have a final cut. They didn't have a say at that point. Uh, but, 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 but I would definitely promise them loyalty in words of not judgmenting them. And well, my thing with this project was I wanted to humanize the dehumanized. I felt that we had seen in the Danish press after the war and, and, and in the last years, we had seen enough stories about young men that were portrayed as uh, violent by nature, looking for, 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 for excitement, shooting for fun, all those kind of stories. And the meeting with these guys made me realize that that wasn't the full truth. Uh, there were actually human beings out there. Um, so talking to them, I had one side covered, you could say. I had the witnesses of war from, from a Danish perspective. But to, to, to be truthful in this film, I needed um, another version. So we went down to, to Turkey towards the, the border of uh, Syria and, and found uh, Afghan refugees that had flew that war from the Helmand province. So they had actually been affected by the Danish soldiers in their daily lives and left their homes uh, because of what happened down there. And talking to those people and talking to those families made me realize um, what Taliban was. For me, it was like a, a defined group of evil people at the point, to be 
honest. Um, but understanding how it works and how this whole country is not even a country but a lot of tribes and, and that whole thing, of course, nuanced my, my vision of what Afghanistan is and isn't. Mm. And in that process, we had probably the most scary day that I've ever had on research. I just had a meeting with a guy. We casted him. He was great. And afterwards, he said, just so you know, I've been fighting for Taliban. And I remember thinking, how the fuck do I, and pardon my French, how do I make this phone call to the guys at home? How do I tell the guys that the people you fought like two years ago will probably act in the same film as you? How do you feel about that? I didn't really know how to do it. So I decided to do what I promised them, just to be honest. So I phoned uh, Martin, who was the first guy I met at the wedding. And I said, listen, I met this guy, and, and he's pretty, he knows some pretty good stuff, but he's been fighting for Taliban. And he said, well, just tell the guys and let's meet him. So we all went down, had tea at his, his humble house. And what happened pretty slowly was I was the outsider. I was the amateur. These guys had stories that they could share because you know the Danish soldiers knew stuff that this guy wanted to know. And he knew stuff that they wanted to know. So quite fast, it became a conversation between warriors that had been fighting in the same conflict on each side, but they respected each other in that way. And one of the Danish soldiers turned to me and said, listen, don't be nervous. I understand this guy better than I understand you. You stayed at home and drank rosé with your wife. I mean, we went out there and fought this, this, this war. So we decided to team up, and he helped us build the, the, the Afghan village and, and, and you know, organize everything, and for me, be the witness to every event from his point of view, so that I wouldn't be, 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 be telling stuff that wasn't true. Fantastic. I do have some further questions about uh, your cast and other things, but I don't want to use up everyone else's time. So can I have a show of hands for any questions uh, so far uh, we might have? I think we've got a roving mic. So yeah, there's someone on the aisle here first. Thanks. Uh, yes, my name is Helen. Is that working? It is working, OK. Um, my name's Helen. I really enjoyed it. But I wondered if you, there was an episode of Borgen that was also set in Afghanistan. Um, and it, it was quite central to the whole part of that series, I think, wasn't it? Um, all the political ramifications and the compromises and things that were going on. Did you, did you get any inspiration from that? I'm not sure if you directed that one or not. I, I wrote that episode. Oh, you uh, wrote it? OK. Yeah. Mm. Um, and well, the thing is, I was developing this story while writing that episode. So what affected what, I'm not sure, um, to be honest. But I do remember a meeting with a, with a, with a female, uh, with a woman from Afghanistan who told me all the good sides of the war, what actually happened that was good, which we didn't know about. Um, and that brought nuances to my view of, of what was going on in Afghanistan at the time. Um, but, but it was kind of, at, I, I do believe that, that writing, writing that episode was also part of trying to, to figure a way out how to adjust and how to navigate the Danish political system in this. And, I, and of course, we used the research a lot. And then there was the, the, the fascinating part about doing it in Borgen was that it's a, it's a female prime minister. And that's an old uh, a false saying that you know, the world would be a peaceful place if it was all women. You had Margaret Thatcher here, and, 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 and that could be a proof of the, of the opposite. And, 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 um, and I do believe that we wanted to try to make the first uh, female prime minister in Denmark uh, go pro-war would be, would be a scandal that was interesting to tell about. So, so that's what we tried. And I do believe that that dynamics is, is, is some of the parts in this film as well, yeah. Um, I'll ask my cast question now, because you're obviously building up some, some trust in your, in your actors. You've not only got uh, Pilu Esbeck in the lead role, who is also the lead in Hijacking, but you have uh, Soren Melling as mm -hmm. well as the defense uh, counsel who steps in. Do you find that, have you found a sort of shorthand with those actors so that you can get to what you need more quickly? Yeah, the thing is, I like them. Yeah. And there's so, much things, there's so many things in the world that doesn't work, so when something works, you don't want to change it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I knew that it was a really small part, and I was uh, almost embarrassed to call Saren Melling to ask him to do it. And he read the screenplay and was like, no, it's great. I want to do that, you know. So, so he was all on, and I knew that he would be able to pull it off in a very naturalistic way. So I, had, you know, I didn't need to work that much with him. Um, Pilou has become like, we follow each other. We started out together just out of film school and actor school. And, um, and yeah, I, I'm a little, you know, I'm, scared. I'm I'm probably the only guy in the world who's hoping for him to get killed pretty soon in, in, in Game of Thrones so he can come back to Denmark, <laughs> uh, not losing him to the big world. Uh, no, I mean, he is, um, 
He's a really, really talented, gifted actor, and he doesn't care whether he's ugly or fat or whatever. He just wants to be honest, mm. and that for me is a source of of of, uh, of inspiration uh, in my work. He really makes moments count, like the moment when he sees the photo of a foot, and you, you sort of know it as it sinks in. You know he can never forget that image. He kind of gives you that feeling very powerfully. I also love the actress playing the prosecuting um, counsel. I don't know her name, but she's terrific as well. She, she's Charlotte, Charlotte Monk. Yeah. She's a great uh, Danish actress. She did a huge TV show uh, some years ago in Denmark. It was a success. And she's done a lot of theater. And I remember we, we, I saw a casting with her. I don't even remember the, but I remember, I don't remember what it was for, but I remember watching and I was like, wow, she's great. I want to work with her one day. So um, she, was, she was not perfect for the wife. Mm -hmm. So she, didn't, she wasn't on that list. But then we wrote the project. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. let's get her in. And I mean, she nailed it. Mm -hmm. She was so um, precise in everything she did. And she teamed up with the prosecutor, the military prosecutor uh, in Denmark, and he would teach her everything, how to say the words right, that, things that I wouldn't know. So mm -hmm. in many ways, he directed her throughout the, the trial uh, to be as naturalistic as possible. Mm. I'll throw it open again now. Here's, here's a question. Great, thank you. You said oh. there was an Afghan woman. You said what were the... Uh, the Afghan woman said that there were good things that had came out of the war. What are those good things? Um, in her point of view, in her point of view, <coughs> some of the good things were that girls were able to go to school. They were getting educated and actually leaving the compounds they were living in. They were becoming part of the world and given the opportunity to be something else than somebody's wife. In her point of view, that was a positive product of the invasion and the overturn from the Taliban regime. Um, and I remember her talking of it like, she said, I know you feel bad about what's going on, but you have to understand that there is a positive side to this. And that was some of the points she made. She made the point that she could actually now travel the world and talk about this, that, that, that her sister uh, had been divorced since because it suddenly was possible instead of her living in a, so, so those were the cases she brought up as positive products of, of, of the war. Anyone else? We've got one. Yes, right in the middle, and then. Huge congratulations on your film. I was very impressed. Thank you. Um, so three questions. Did, did something very close to that actually happen? Uh, do you think that the butcher was lying in court? And can you imagine a Hollywood remake? Um, yes, all these things happened, not in that order. I took bits and pieces from a lot of realities, a lot of stories, and put them together to this story. But yes, all these things were, were part of, of the, the, the Danish soldier's reality that I researched into. So, um, um, second question. Oh, I know he's lying, but you know what? He's educated to save his friends. That's what we train the soldiers to do. That's what make them, makes them good soldiers. So why wouldn't he? I know that if my brother was prosecuted and I could help him in any way, I would. Um, I'm a team player, and I cannot lie about that. I don't think it's civilized. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's part of a democracy, but I would. So I totally understand it and, 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 and bear sympathy with it. Is it the right thing to do? I'm not sure. But for him, it is. He couldn't do anything else, and I don't think that he could live on being him without doing it, so I'm, I'm pretty sure he's lying. An American remake, you know, I don't think, it, it wouldn't probably be a remake because there is military courts in, in the US that we don't have in Denmark. But I definitely think that the importance and the relevance of this story could happen over there. The relevance of being a, a tool sent out by politicians and then coming home and being confronted with the same rule, you know, lawmakers uh, when you come back home. So I think there's a relevance in any warfaring nation to a story like this. Whether it should be a remake or not, I think this film is perfect. Um, so you don't, you don't need to remake it in any way. But you know, you can find inspiration in it and, and, and make another film. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about the, uh, the, the shoot on the first half of the film um, and how long it took and what challenges you, you, you encountered in getting all of that on screen? And did it, was it a more or less difficult shoot than your shoot on the hijacking, which must have been quite, quite tough in itself? Well, at least on a hijacking, we were just on a boat. You know, we could control everything. Um, there was a lot of moving parts in Turkey. 
just around the time when we started to shoot, we would have a lot of soldiers from different parts of the world traveling to Turkey, going to Syria, which meant that suddenly the borders would close to weapons that we would bring in. So I remember after a few days of shooting, um, we didn't have any weapons yet. We didn't have any ammunition. We didn't have any helicopters. We didn't have anything. And I, I remember talking to my producer like, we're making a war film here. Could you, you know, it's kind of hard without weapons. <laughs> yeah, but we can shoot a little more in camp and let's see what happens. So we became to a point where I was starting to doubt that it would ever happen and that I would, you know, we would need to make a really <laughs> dramatic voiceover to make this work. Um, but then finally, uh, weapons came through and ammunition came through and, and it helped. I think it helped this production a lot that it was actually professional soldiers we had on set. Pilou and, 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 and two other small parts are the only actors. The rest is real soldiers that served in Afghanistan. And the big difference between uh, film crews, actors, and everybody else I'm used to working with and soldiers is that soldiers, they come on time and do what they're told. <laughs> so that makes a good work day pretty easy to cope with. So finally, when the weapon and the ammunition showed up, I actually think that I don't remember all the days. Everything is kind of in a blur. But I remember a feeling of being very close to something um, that, that, was, that we could use. Um, so it was, um, it was great. The feeling of having both Taliban refugees and Danish soldiers on the same film set was psychologically demanding in the first couple of days. But when it started to work out, it actually became a huge gift, and, and everybody had this sense of seriousness over them. So there wasn't too much fooling around and too many cigarette breaks. When we were shooting, everybody was pretty focused on getting close to the truth. Um, so that was a great gift. Mm. Right, I think we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. Uh, hello, thank you. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Um, really original um, human tale, uh, which for me was kind of a, about the sort of moral collateral damage of war, which I think is really uh, important stuff. Um, my question is a bit more general, though. I hope you don't mind. Um, in terms of writing, being a writer and a director, do you prefer writing for yourself? Is it easier to write for yourself, knowing that you're going to direct it eventually? Or is the process different in any way between uh, the, two, the two jobs? Yeah, I think the, the process is very different. When I write for other directors, let's say Thomas Winterberg, who I've been working uh, with for a, co a couple of times now, I am trying to write as perfect a screenplay as possible for him, which means to understand what he can do as a director, what kind of stuff he can do. He can do stuff that I, don't, I, I, that, that I could never do. Uh, those of you who have seen The Hunt, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scene in a church. And basically every time the script would come back to me from Thomas reading, he would have put that scene back in. And every time I sent it back, I deleted it. And finally, he gave me a call and he says, what's up with you in that church scene? I was like, I, I don't see you pulling this off. It's not going to work. And now that's in the film, I'm like, hell yeah, <laughs> he pulled it off. Um, so in that way, yes, it's very different. I'm more sloppy when I'm writing for me because I know what I want. So I don't need to be that precise. Uh, writing for other directors, I tend to be more into getting the structure perfect knowing that I'm going to carry it from idea and all the way to the editing room makes it more as, you know, what we could call free jazz. You know, I can, I can make it work along the way as long as the big plot points are there. Um, that doesn't work writing for the directors. That I, I need to be more precise um, in my work. But thank you. Um, anyone else? I've got another one, actually. We'll come to you in one second. I'll just ask my one first. Mm -hmm. um, the film opened in Denmark, I think, at the end of September, you mentioned. Um, and obviously it's been very successful and it's been the, the official nomination for the, the Oscars, etc. Has there been a good level of political discussion around it as well in the press? And has it, has it, has it been kind of a film that's been debated uh, in Denmark? The fun thing is, yes, it has. But I think that the film proves a point, for me anyway, that the whole Danish being part of that war has been captured and a discussion whether you're pro or against that. Um, and I didn't want to participate in that. I think it's foolish. I think it's a waste of time. I think what we need to do is to, as human beings, try to get back in contact with each other. And the only way you can do that is not to stand in each side of a room screaming, you're right or you're wrong. It's actually to invite for a conversation about what happened. And for me, that was proven. I have three small kids. and. Um, 
I remember I had to take him to school a couple of days after the premiere. And this guy passed me in the street, and I noticed that he was looking at me. But I didn't notice him too much. I had, I had three small boys, you know, so there was a lot to look after uh, with them. Uh, but then he would come back, and he was crying. And I didn't really know how to react, because I was there with three small boys, and now this stranger is coming up crying in the street, and what's going on? And my oldest son reacted to it. But, but then he said, I'm so sorry. I just want you to know I served two times. Um, I saw your film last night. I haven't slept all night because I've been talking to my wife. And I actually think that you saved my, our marriage. Finally, I could tell her what I've done down there, and she could tell me how, what it felt to be back home. Um, honestly, without limits, just speaking. And I remember calling Pilou right after, just after explaining to my kids why strangers were coming in the streets crying, um, and saying, I think we made it. Fuck the reviewers. We actually did it. We, we touched people and made this work as a tool in this democracy to get people to have a conversation about being a warfaring nation, and that was the full point of, of making this film. Mm. Thanks. We'll just finally take your question. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us about your process of um, raising money for the movie, whether you, because you say you wanted to make a war movie before you knew you, you had this movie in mind. Was it, did you, you, you go after the funding yourself when you've got the idea, or do you have like lots of people waiting for your next project and uh, throwing money at you? Um, yeah, what's the process there in your Sounds case? Sounds great. <laughs> um, nobody was throwing money. But I was lucky enough that, that after a hijacking, um, a few more doors for me was open. So I knew at least who to contact with this idea. I have the same producers that I've been working with on the three features I've done. Um, so we knew in development, I could just start to write the thing. That's, that's not the most expensive part. Um, and then. So we would start to develop the film, and then Studio Canal got involved pretty early and believed in the project and, and, and backed us up. So, so it became a collaboration between Nordic Film from Denmark and Studio Canal to raise the money. And it, 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 I would write for that budget that we have then um, to make sure that we had artistic freedom and neither Studio Canal, Studio Canal or Nordic Film would interfere with that process. So in many ways, it was a very, very uh, um, privileged position to be in. Then. I had twins just after I did a hijacking, and that's a challenge. So I promised my wife not to, not to shoot another film until they turned two, and my producer knew this. So a week after my twins' second birthday, we were ready to shoot. Everything was just standing there uh, uh, ready. So yeah, uh, it worked out. We are privileged in Denmark. We have the Danish Film Institute. We can go and, and get money from the government to develop projects. So it doesn't have to have, from the beginning, um, you can say uh, um, a commercial value. You can go and just from the idea, get money. So Nordic Film and, and the Danish Film Institute would get me started. Studio Canal got in, and it, it, it became a pretty smooth process, actually. Well, unless anyone else has any final question, um, please join me in thanking Tobias for coming, coming tonight and for, for his film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.